Uh, Professor Pelt is an associate professor in international history at the Saxo Institute of Copenhagen. He's also co-director of the Center Many Roads in Modernity at the University of Copenhagen and a member of the international network Catholic States, Divided Societies, Political Institutions of Southeastern Europe in a Historical Comparative Perspective of the Volkswagen Foundation. His book, Time, Greece to the West, U.S.-West German-Greek Relations, 1949 to 1974, published in 2006, was critically acclaimed. Um, he, um, uh, to, to, to tonight, he's going to talk to us uh, about the case of the Greek junta as a cause in European public opinion and politics, a catalyst for change. And I think uh, he will take uh, as a point of departure the period before the military coup d'etat in '67 to discuss how the broader dimension of Greek internal affairs became a concern outside of Greece and um, also seek to explain why this happened in the 60s and not before. So, Moritz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this conference on a subject which is very important, I would say, not only in Greek history, not only in European history, so the history actually, and also for giving me the opportunity to, to come here and talk about this period. Uh, in some sense, it has been with me since I was a kid, uh, not in a very analytical way, but Greece took up a lot of space in Danes media, in Danes families, uh, in my family. I didn't really know what it was, but it was something important, at least so much I could tell uh, that uh, that time when I was nine years old and it could uh, happen. Um, and it is so because the process uh, that forced on 1969 and the uh, withdrawal from Greece from the uh, Council of Europe uh, is uh, in many ways a turning point, at least in the relations between the uh, West European states uh, in the Cold War period uh, and in the post war period, first of all. Um, it was a culmination, uh, the withdrawal of Greece and the Council of Europe, uh, the culmination of, of a protracted struggle as to which status uh, universal rights should have in relation to the principle of national or, or state <coughs> sovereignty. Uh, we know that human rights have been uh, on the agenda in the various UN organizations in the cultural period, but the Greek case was the first one to have uh, an impact on uh, intra-European uh, relations. I'm talking about uh, the relationship between uh, universal rights and uh, state sovereignty. Uh, we should mention that the history of tensions between national sovereignty or state sovereignty and the privacy of universal rights uh, begins long time before the post war period and also goes beyond the end of the Cold uh, War. Um, I think it's also equally important to stress that the, these struggles, these tensions took place, let's say, in very different periods, which were characterized by their own internal norms. And I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that the period uh, from the end of the Second World War to the end of the Cold War was uh, the period in which, let's say, uh, the, um, the internal norms were, were uh, less or most uh, in uh, conducted to the privacy of universal rights, uh, and that is uh, true compared to the period before, but also to the period uh, afterwards. So that, of course, raises the question: Why was it the military coup d'état in Greece in 1967, and its abuse of human rights that became a game changer in the post-war period? Why, for example, was it not the condemnation and execution of Nikos Belloyanis in 1950, or the case in 52, which actually caused a lot of reactions uh, around in the world, but never impacted uh, European opinion to the same degree as did the uh, UNSA? Uh, you know that there were protests from prominent uh, leaders around, uh, 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 cultural leaders around the world, like uh, Pablo Picasso, Charlie Chaplin, Paul Sartre. Then they were executed these people, and they were raising the question why in Greece it was the people who had fought the Nazis who were prosecuted uh, for their left wing views, while Nazi collaborators were awarded with post in the Greek government. 
Or why did not the European states uh, and uh, the allies of Turkey uh, took any measures against Ankara, against the Turkish government, after the military coup d'etat in 1960? Why did, not, why did they not react to the monster processes uh, held on an isolated island in the Marmara Sea against the democratically elected government? And why did they not react against the military regime's hanging of the prime minister and two of his colleagues? Mm -hmm. After all, Turkey too was a member of the Council of Europe. Now to, to explain that um, difference, I think we shall uh, seek the causes in the turn public opinion uh, in Western European societies are taking uh, in the 60s. Fear of nuclear war and a rising awareness of the destructive potential of the very same Western systems which had fostered an unseen growth and an unseen welfare now blazed the way for protest movements and for the creation of a wider audience which was most receptive to, uh, let's say, an articulated critique of the present conditions of Western society. Uh, this took place at a time when America's war in Vietnam was uh, escalating, and a juncture of time in the nature, if we could call it like that, and I will do so, the nature of a coalition and the nature of the institutions, which were fundamental or had been fundamental for the stabilization of post war the post-war West came under rising scrutiny. In West Germany, for example, the very foundation on which the Wirtschaftswunder, the German economic miracle, and the German uh, reconstruction after the war was based, was taken to task uh, because of the official unwillingness to face Germany's Nazi part, the past. At least it was so for the so-called um, um, extra-parliamentary opposition. It was a movement, it was a reaction to the so-called Grand Coalition uh, and the two biggest parties in Germany, the Social Democrats and the Conservatives, uh, joined forces and the government, meaning that they were representing 90% of all the seats in the parliament. On the one hand, you had a chancellor, uh, Kurt Georg Kiesinger, who was the first and only member of the Nazi party to become uh, chancellor in Germany. And on the other hand, you had Didi Brandt, who was a famous uh, resistance uh, personality against the Nazi regime. So where was any room for, for opposition was the uh, question. In the Netherlands in 1966, uh, 66 in Republic of Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam became the scene of uh, protests. The uh, occasion was the wedding between Princess Beatrix and the former Wehrmacht soldier Klaus van Amsberg, who had also been a member of various Nazi youth organizations. And at the time, in 66, and with the memories, the memory of the German oppression of um, Holland being still very strong, uh, the demonstrations in, in Amsterdam made many people think that Beatrix might well be the last monarch of the Netherlands. The same sort of scrutiny would also bring uh, certain illiberal aspects of post-war Greek society to attention uh, long before the coup d'etat in Greece. One such occasion was the holding of political prisoners. And this became very clear in May 1963 during uh, Queen Frederica's visit, private visit to London. And the reaction to her visit culminated uh, a few months later in the largest protest in Britain since the 1930s when the royal couple made an official uh, visit to the British capital. Among the protesters were prominent figures such as the leader of the British Labour Party. Prime Minister Harold Wilson, and you would also find the philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell, who was a key campaign against nuclear arms, against the US war in Vietnam, and later famous for his uh, Russian tribunals, established in order to, to, um, to, to um, try uh, war criminals, also from the American army, because of their behavior in the war in Vietnam. Um, we should also uh, mention that the past of Frederick as a member of a youth organization, Bund Deutscher Mädel, was brought up. Uh, and of course also the reactions in June 1963 should be seen against the background of the killing of uh, Rigoris Labrakis in uh, Greece, a uh, peace activist, a member of the Elad, a left wing party in Greece, and a professor at the University of Athens. The unleashed protest movements in Greece also, demonstrations, 
gave birth to the so-called Z generation. I think you are the one who actually brought that word into existence. Um, and the emergence of Milan Draghi's youth movement, which more or less was a kind of, let's say, equivalent to, to, to the new left uh, in, um, in the West. And in the wake of the so-called July events in 1965 and King Constantine provoked the fall of George Papandreou's government, this generation was active in organizing strikes and demonstrations <laughs> against a system that was seen as illegitimate and <coughs> repressive. So, William Bracky's case made, and the July events, made Greece a symbol of the compromise which post -war, the post-war West was accused of having made with fascism and atavistic, undemocratic institutions to fight communism. One of the fundamental critics, more broadly speaking, of this compromise was that it was blurring the lines between the state and uh, capitalism, that it was causing conversions of their interest, and it was leading to concentration of enormous power that had led to the emergence of the youth bureaucracy, the so-called system, which created, according to the accusations, alienation, which was ready to manipulate its own citizens, which was ready to exploit lesser developed nations in order to secure its own survival. The most uh, articulated opponents were informed uh, by the critique formulated by the so-called Frankfurt School uh, in their theories about the crisis uh, of late capitalist society. And all this, and the other in the 60s before we could retire, uh, left to the emergence of a new left. Uh, those main three <coughs> was that the traditional institutions and the ruling post-war political parties were both symptoms and causes for the turn the West had taken since the end of the war. The new left would especially target the social democratic parties uh, for this turn, as we shall see. I shall now turn to Denmark, uh, where Greece would become a very prominent symbol of crisis. For the new left in Denmark, Greece uh, was a symbol of the crisis of late capitalism. For social democrats in Denmark, Greece was a symptom of a crisis that could be overcome if Greece caught up with the rest of the West in terms of economic and political development. The Greek monarchy became the main point of focus for this crisis in Denmark. It was a royal engagement in 1963 between the Greek, Greek crown prince uh, Constantine and the Danish princess <coughs> Maria, and of course not least the wedding the following year in 1964, which first what did direct uh, the attention of Danes to Greece. It was the first major royal event which was covered by national white television, something which made Constantine a household name in Denmark. And making members of the Greek royal family household names in Denmark was also true to some extent for his mother, Queen Frederica. <laughs> and with her also rumors that she did not play by the rules of the democratic game, and that Constantine was under her influence. This was also reflected by the highest level uh, in Denmark when it became known that the Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hegerov was his name, during the wedding in Athens, had lectured Queen Frederica about the role of a Queen Mother and the rules which a monarch should observe to survive in a modern democratic society. <laughs> in this way, the Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was also a social democrat, was reenacting to some extent a role which, according to social democratic legend in Denmark, its leader, the leader of the Social Democratic Party, had played more than 40 years ago in 1920, when Denmark was a, you know, going through a constitutional crisis because of the monarchy, uh, a crisis which was overcome by the intervention uh, by the um, leader of the Social Democracy in order to, let's say, or with a result of taming the monarchy in Denmark incorporated into the democracy. So in that way, repeating the account of Hegerov's lecturing of the Queen of Greece, uh, also a free mother, was also a way to celebrate the, let's say, progressive impact of social democratic reforms in Denmark and to reject the accusations against it of compromising the interest of the people on the altar of the system. But the Greek case also mobilized a number of young social democrats 
was the Labrakis case, which first made us aware that something was wrong in Greece, recalls Mons Cameron. <coughs> Mons Cameron was a young social democrat at the time, he was regarded as being a part of the left-wing social democratic party, he was among the intellectual uh, avant-garde in the party, and um, many years later he would go to the Danish People's Party, the National Conservative Party, uh, a outspoken xenophobic um, turn. But this is many, many years later in this period, this world was, was very different. Kamara was a central figure in the early efforts of, direction, uh, of, of uh, directing attention in Denmark to the illegal uh, and repressive aspects of the political practice in Greece. At that time, when he began his uh, endeavors, Kamara was chairman of Free Forum, which was an association of social democratic students and graduates. Association was founded in 1943 during the third German occupation of Denmark, and it was founded as a protest against the policy of collaboration by the main Danish parties, including the social democracy with the German occupiers. At the time, the time that the Greek case came up in Denmark, uh, <clears throat> the new left was gaining traction, attraction among students and youth. Uh, the New Left was taking the official Danish pro-American policy to task, demanding, among other things, that Denmark should be later, and it was most vociferous in its criticism of the social democracy because of its pro nato line. Um, as an act to demonstrate that the social democrats are not blind to the dark side of America's global hegemony and not blind to NATO's anti-communist pragmatism, Free Forum or Cameras movement turned the spotlight on the dictatorships in Portugal and Spain, while it was also criticizing America's war in Vietnam. This caused, to say the least, some discomfort among some social democrats. Cameras tells that he was contacted by the Labor Union's Information Center, called AIC, an acronym, an acronym if you Spit it the other way, become CIA, it's a funny thing to say, <laughs> uh, because this organization was established by the Social Democrat major labor unions in order to collect information on the communists during the war and afterwards. But Conrad was also contacted by another person, by the chairman of the Danish branch of the anti communist <coughs> CIA supported organization for, uh, for the Congress, uh, uh, called the Co Congress of Cultural Freedom. The chairman suggested that Camera and his organization, Free Forum, aligned with the Congress for Cultural Freedom. We know that the chairman of this organization was a social democrat and that he was deeply <coughs> worried about the destructive impact of the war in Vietnam on the Danish perceptions of the US. So I don't think it's far fetched to, to, to uh, at least suggest that he might have seen the criticism against the US and NATO from the non-communist free forum of Kamra as a beneficial alternative to left-wing protest and mobilization and as a way to prove wrong the accusations from the left, the new left that is, that the social democracy, democracy did not care. And all this uh, bears witness, I would say, to the fact that Kamra's young social democrats and the new left were competing to profile themselves by the same contentious issues that challenged the claims that by the Western Alliance that it supported freedom and democracy. However, their goals were different. While the New Left demanded that Denmark should leave NATO, the Social Democrats, also the young one, wanted Denmark to remain in that alliance. This is important at this point of time because uh, NATO uh, was becoming an increasing issue in Denmark, and because uh, in uh, 1969, Denmark would have the theoretical possibility of leaving NATO according to the rules, rules stipulated by the alliance. It would require a referendum, uh, and that made the supporters of NATO in Denmark fear that the increasingly unpopular war in Vietnam uh, and NATO support of dictatorships would turn their opinion against NATO membership of, of NATO. But there was more to it also. While the new left was castigating the social democrats were being part and parcel of a system that had been created to uphold the compromise between the state and capitalism, 
and for that reason, for that reasons, uh, accusing it of being something of doing something which was wrong. Social Democrats, including Mons Camera, saw the same compromise as the pre precondition for the enormous rise in wealth which the West have witnessed since the war, and also as the precondition for its, let's say, fair distribution, which started the depression, among other things, in the welfare state. So for them, the compromise between the state and capitalism was not a vice, but it was a desirable method that to bring societies out of poverty and out of political backwardness. And if you read and if you listen and you go through the papers of Mons Cameron, it is clear that he considered Greece as a victim of poverty and saw the Greek monarchy as a symbol of political backwardness. So this was the point of view, point of departure from which he would begin to engage himself in the Greek case and it was something which soon would bring him into direct contact with the Papandreou family. The connection with that family uh, would materially materialized after Mons Kamra was contacted by uh, Yorgos Mavroyenis from the Embassy of Greece in Copenhagen. Mavroyenis told uh, Mons Kamra that he supported George Papandreou. He wanted the Central Union, uh, he was supporting the Central Union, and he wanted to uh, keep Kamra up updated about the situation in Greece. Mavroyenis also suggested that Kamra should function as a connection between the Embassy in Copenhagen, between Mavroyenis that is, uh, and the Danish government, and Kammerer accepted, later he stayed, yeah, some such, uh, so on the grounds that the regime increased in the 60s before the Hunter was undemocratic. The July events in 65 turned Kammerer into an activist. Uh, he regarded George Papandreou's forced resignation as the king's first coup, and uh, he deemed it to be against all rules of the parliamentary game. And uh, he also decided at that occasion afterwards to, to act uh, and convey his uh, direct protest to Constantine, who happened to be in Denmark in 66 uh, to participate in a sailing regatta. And Monskander wanted to deliver to the king uh, the text of a European Convention of Human Rights, and also a letter condemning the violation of democracy in Greece, and a letter which demanded the release of political prisoners. He never made the king uh, receive the letter, but he succeeded in making headlines in the Danish press and to uh, bring up the issue uh, in, in the Danish public opinion. It was also the time when most Kammer decided to establish personal contacts to Andreas Papandreou and to the Central Union. And here we should uh, mention that in the eyes of uh, Kammer, uh, Andreas Papandreou was an exponent of modern politics. He was a kind of social democrat, a democrat in his eyes. He was well versed in modern economics. He had taken planning to his heart. This is something which some Kammer mentions. Remember that planning, state planning, was very known in the West at that time for, for, for the modern societies, uh, a model to which Kammer also subscribed. Um, so this means that in Kammer's optics, uh, Andreas Papandreou had the political prerequisites to bring Greece, let's say, on the track of development and modernization and democracy. It was the Aspina affair and the campaign against uh, Andreas Papandreou that made Kammerer decide to invite uh, Andreas Papandreou to Denmark and give him a very good opportunity to, to tell his version of what was happening in Greece. Andreas Papandreou was received in Copenhagen in the airport in the same manner as if he was an, on an official visit. During his visit, which lasted from the 9th to the 11th of October 1966, at last, Papandreou met with uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ekebo, the Minister of Economics. Uh, the dinner in his honor was held in the premises of the Social Democrat newspaper, Actuelt, but it was arranged as if it was a government dinner. It was hosted uh, by the Danish Prime Minister, the Social Democrat, Jens Otto Um This desire uh, to, to see Andreas Papandreou, to meet him, was not only confined to the Danish Soviet democracy, but it was a uh, kind of desire which you also will find among the uh, Soviet Democrat parties in Sweden and Norway. Andreas's visit to Denmark was one among three on the 12th day political tour to Scandinavia, and the other calls on his tour included Stockholm and Oslo, 
was the invitation to the Dixil Lectures in Stockholm in the honor of the Swedish economist and the Dixil that had made the tour possible. And here I should say that Dixil's works were, I don't know if they are very, very that anymore, but they were fundamental to modern macroeconomics. This teaching was taken to heart by various Swedish governments, first of all, his editions uh, of the welfare state. In Oslo, the class was to speak to the Norwegian <coughs> organization. Uh, he was invited by uh, Arne Child, a young social democrat, socialist, with a newspaper, uh, so, uh, social democrat with a newspaper, Arbeiterblad, uh, who had met Andreas in uh, Athens, July the same year. Uh, years later, Trabot was convicted for espionage for the Soviet Union, but in our period, that is in the 60s, from 66 and onwards, during the period of the Junta, he was a central person in the movement against the Norway, uh, Norway against the uh, Greek dictatorship. Uh, he was the founder of uh, the Committee for Democracy in Greece. The uh, Swedish uh, engagement in Greece was, uh, of course, very much linked to uh, Sweden being ruled by Soviet Democrats. But Sweden also had another role, which is a little bit different from the one in Norway and Denmark. Sweden was a neutral country, and after the end of the Second World War, it became a kind of a moral great power. Uh, it uh, supplied the UN with uh, personalities of great importance, actually, in some of the uh, parts of conflict around in the world. I could mention Ferdinand Dodi, who was actually killed by Jewish terrorists by the Stern Gang. Palestine in 1946, and then they fought to, to solve the Palestine problem. It didn't succeed. Uh, Doug Hammarskjöld was fighting for the uh, independence of African countries from colonialism. It crashed in an airplane in 1961, I think. So you have this profile in Sweden, which made the Greek case a very uh, obvious one to uh, react to. Now, I will now turn back to, to Denmark again. Where Kammer and the government was, let's say, infusing new dynamics into the Greek case. I should say that at last, that, uh, that most Kamra was staying in, in a permanent contact with uh, the Papandreou family through a Barclay Papandreou, that was corresponding uh, by letters. And in early April 1967, uh, Kamra uh, contacted uh, the Danish Prime Minister Charles <coughs> to suggest that the Soviet democracy of Denmark should cooperate with the Papandreou's in Greece. And uh, he wanted to go to Greece. Karma <coughs> gave Karma a green light to go to Athens to find out what the Central Union wanted, and suggested also that the Greek party, uh, or that the Danish party, should assist the Greek party in establishing a democratic party organization. On the 17th of April, Karma went to Athens and so checked in at the Colpertani Hotel. So he was in Greece during the coup d'etat. Uh, he wouldn't come back to Denmark until uh, the 23rd of April, uh, the same month. And in the airport, when he returned, he was met by uh, Prime Minister Karl, who immediately sent a note of protest in the name of the Danish government against the arrest of the Papandreos, uh, and also the George. And uh, on the day, I mean, on the 23rd of April, the Danish government returned to, to Denmark. The uh, West German Minister of Foreign Affairs and leader of the Social Democratic Party, Willy Brandt, happened to be in the airport. We had given him a visit to Kral, and Kavler was asked to brief Brandt about what was going on in Greece. He some questions for what he knew. We don't have any details from this meeting, but we know that four days later, uh, on the 27th of April, representatives of the Central Union of West Germany met at the headquarters of the Social Democratic Party in Denmark to define its goals and form a program now if the, after the military has taken over power in Greece. On the 2nd of May, uh, the Foreign Policy Committee of the Danish Parliament, this is a relatively powerful organization among all the parties in Denmark, decided that Denmark should make a declaration in the NATO Council the following day. But, uh, because the Greek representative threatened to leave the meeting, the general director of NATO decided to, 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 to end the meeting before the protest could be made, uh, be made in uh, orally, and instead the Danish government sent that written declaration to the NATO ambassadors on the 5th of May, expressing its regret about the recent developments in Greece, and expressing the hope that the country would soon return to democracy. Uh, 
the Norwegian government had sent a similar message uh, and on the 10th of May, the Scandinavian Prime Minister's meeting in Oslo decided to summon the Ministerial Committee of the Council of Europe to discuss the coup d'etat uh, in uh, Greece. This sounds like a very smooth path, but we should also uh, notice that the Danish Prime Minister had his doubts. He was not sure if filing a complaint with uh, the Human Rights Commission was the right, thing, uh, the right way to go. He would rather like to use uh, a multilateral approach to the Greek uh, case. Uh, he still wanted to, to support the return of democracy uh, in Greece. And he made this point very clear in a private letter to the Minister, Minister of Culture in Denmark called Woody Cox. It was uh, difficult sometimes to handle for crowds. He was more outspoken about uh, almost everything in international politics. And in the letter to her, she wrote, he wrote, sorry, that the marginal approach, and I quote, gives us the possibility of getting support for the main argument that what happens in Greece is also of our concern as a member of Western associations in which Greece too is a member. And this became a kind of a key concept in the rest of the process. It was not just smooth, of course, but, but as an idea. Uh, multilateral and multinational approach also implicated joint action by the Scandinavian countries. And as uh, our ambassador mentioned in his uh, speech, uh, the Scandinavian countries in this period were working very hard to, to intensify their very corporate uh, cooperation. There were even talks about formalizing it in a political kind of, of uh, um, let's say, parallel organization to, to the um, economic uh, to, 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 the, um, to the EEC at the time. Uh, at home, uh, Crown, the Danish Prime Minister, did not conceal that Constantine, King Constantine at the time, was persona non grata in Denmark. He forced the Danish King not to invite King Constantine to the wedding of his daughter, Crown Princess Margareta, who was going to marry a French nobleman uh, in June 1967, this caused certain problems with the courts, which is a uh, you know, different story in this context, but this is a much which is discussed once in a while. And in September 1967, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and then also the Netherlands filed complaints concerning violations by Greece at the European Commission for Human Rights. This was not the only voice, the voice of Kammer, the voice of Prague in Denmark, uh, there were also other voices. In September, at the same time, and the um, complaint was filed, the uh, Minister of Trade and Markets in Denmark criticized the government's line uh, on the grounds that it was wrong for a small country like Denmark to confront the Greek regime in the manner that the government did. Denmark, he said, should confine itself to take care of its trade interests. He got fired for that by Prague because it was going against the government line. In the same period, it became very clear also that uh, several representatives of the right of the censor were actually supporting Constantine, King Constantine. They would defend his role in the forced resignation of George Papandreou in July 65. Uh, they would depict Constantine as a bulwark against communism. And the most elaborate argument on this issue was given by a journalist called Uri Kivarik. He was a former mem not member of the Danish resistance. Of the conservative uh, group of, of uh, resistant fighters. He was a close associate of another conservative politician, very tied to the resistance, called Christmas Müller, in, in London. And Kielerick depicted Andreas Papandreou as a pawn in the game of the control of the Mediterranean and claimed that the Soviets had supported him in order to achieve what they had failed to do during the Greek Civil War, namely Soviet dominance of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, if I had more time, I will, I don't have, but I should mention <laughs> that the wording, the wording of Gilevic is almost exact, the same wording which Constantine used when he turned up at the American Embassy uh, in March and April uh, before the coup, coup took place, when he was pressing the Americans to give him a green light to take over power or to make this extra parliamentary solution, as it was called. It was exactly the same portrait uh, so probably he was well informed of the theory from, let's say, the right sources uh, in Denmark. So 
the main arguments against uh, an uh, activist policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Greek regime uh, was that Denmark was a small state and that it might also jeopardize its security interests. And as we shall see, uh, Denmark was bringing up the issue in NATO and had a rather rough time from time to time in the 70s, but this is uh, for the future in relation to what I'm talking about now. It is also clear that there existed a wide sympathy in the Danish, so let's say, public for the Greek royal couple. Uh, many felt sorry for Anna Maria, his Jewish cousin signed by his young age, and he had this dominating mother. Uh, and to some extent, this, I think, must be seen also, let's say, as a general royally struck reaction, something which would make an impression on some in particular on the politicians on the right of the center of Denmark, and of course, first of all, on the conservatives. And yet, after a coalition of three right of the center parties won the elections in Denmark on the 23rd of January 1968, and after they formed a new government, this new government decided to take up the line which was started by the former Soviet Democrat government. So we have to ask why, how this happened. Well, first of all, a lot had happened in Greece uh, since, uh, let's say, April 67. Constantine supported Kulitar in December, had said Rose Free who had opposed the activist policy out of regard for Constantine and for royalist reasons. Uh, furthermore, his exile now made it possible to identify the regime of the Colonel Saldero, and in the era of television and picture post, the colonels compared very poorly, at least in the eyes of the public, to the dashing young king, this is the words of the public, or some of the public opinion at least, and to his beautiful wife. Their class, their manners, their pure education uh, made them an easy pick also among, let's say, the con conventional conservatives and the traditional views of society, of gender relations, as well as the role in family and religion in society, also estranged, let's say, from the rest of the educated press. Furthermore, the release of Atlas Pavel made the Greek case in the eyes of the right of the center parties, let's say, less social democratic, and therefore probably easier to support for those who still believe that he was a communist in disguise. Uh, and then, of course, what really made action also uh, increasingly important on the part of the Danish government was the fear of what the referendum about the Danish future in NATO would bring about. It was looming in the mind of the government because with the, with the fateful year 1969 was approaching, we are now in 1968. So while no Danish government would ever take, let's say, as clear a stand against the American war Southeast Asia as did the late pre the Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme, the Danish government would actually be very outspoken for the rest of the period of the Hunza in the criticism of the Colonel's Greece. And uh, this difference between, let's say, other 68 issues and the Greek case is uh, picked up very well by the French ambassador to Greece, it's a Denmark. Now, I used the French ambassador. <coughs> French government was quite tuned into what happened in Denmark because we had one of their city uh, fellow citizens married to, to a Danish would be queen. So, so this was the focus of many reports. And in this report, the uh, French ambassador to Greece, some, uh, to Denmark, summed up what he saw as the main trends in Danish protest against the Greek regime. And he also compared the, the actions to the Greek regime to reaction to other, let's say, causes of 1968. Of course, first of all, the American war in Vietnam. And he reported the following. On the 21st of April, 1968, about 2,000 people, including 100 Greeks, passed through the streets of Copenhagen in silence. They moved in the direction of the Greek embassy in a torchlight procession. They had long hair, but they were elegantly dressed, and they observed the each red traffic light on the way with more patient than the police officers following them. At the embassy, the speakers delivered the messages, then the demonstration, demonstrations disbanded, with most of it going in the direction of the nearby train station to return to the suburbs. The picture he gave one week later about what happened when 20,000 persons appeared before the American embassy, 
was a protest against the war in Vietnam. That's different. Windows were smashed, as you call it. It's street fighting, and street fighting took place. Molotov cocktails were thrown. And he would go on while this, uh, let's say, kind of activity did not sit well with the ordinary things and the political establishment. The Greek case is completely different, was his conclusion. Danish public opinion is fundamentally hostile to the kernels, if not allergic to it. Something which holds true, uh, we shall see, uh, he said, for the whole political spectrum from left to right. Now, while the while the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands were closing ranks on the issue of human rights, uh, and while they moved, let's say, in the assembly of the Council of Europe, moved against the Hunter, not least owing to Max von der Stoll, I think you pronounce his name, who was a member of the Dutch uh, Labour Party, and those reports on the situation in Greece uh, after a while left little room for doubt that Greece was actually a full blooded dictatorship. While well, this took place, the big Western powers, Britain, France, the US, and West Germany, were very much concerned about what took place in the Council of Europe. And they were so. The German ambassador, the West German ambassador, confided to the, Greek government, to the French government in September 1969. They were so because Bonn regarded the legal arguments in the case against Greece to be well founded, but they feared that the consequences of an expulsion would make the kernels slip and fall into the arms of the Soviet Union. And this would be the main point of view confronting, let's say, the uh, discussions also in the NATO Council on the part of West Germany uh, and other, uh, of the, uh, America also, of course, uh, of the great uh, Western, European, West, Western powers in this period. So to conclude, uh, the Greek case became a cause, I would say, in the course of 68, in a very poor sense. Denmark, the, uh, the transformation began already in 1963 and 64. In the beginning, the process was driven by social democrats who were under pressure from the new left, and by social democrats who wanted to, to demonstrate their concern for the union, virtual values such as democracy and political freedom. The wedding between Constantine and Amelia made the political situation in Greece, Greece a subject of considerable public concern. And this would, of course, culminate after 1967. But the case was not confined to Denmark. The Greek case had also mobilized the opinion in Sweden and Norway before 67. And here it was the first of Andreas Pahanglero, who, at least so it seems from my research, who, let's say, turned the attention of public opinion towards Greece. Like in Denmark, the social democrats were leading before 67 in Norway and uh, Sweden. After the coup d'etat in 1967, uh, the Greek case became a cause uh, on the level of national politics in the three Scandinavian countries who were also joined by the Netherlands. And the, their activism in the Council of Europe slowly forced the Greek powers to change their stance. It did so reluctantly, but sufficiently clear to force the Junta to leave the Council. Now, although Denmark and Norway and Holland would bring up the Greek case in NATO and the NATO Council, the efforts which, let's say, made 1969, the uh, withdrawal of the Hunter from the Council of Europe possible, uh, did not become a, catalyst of, uh, a catalyst, catalyst, catalyst of change of norms until after the collapse of the military regime, I should say, in 1974. And human rights would play an important role in the transition process of Spain and Portugal, and also as a condition for the membership of other countries for Greece of the EU. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pell, for this very interesting talk that gave us um, interesting insights, little well-known, I would say, insights into the, the story of the Scandinavian connection to Greece before the mainly before the dictatorship. Uh, so you know this, this was not born out uh, out of nothing with a Greek case, but it's interesting to see that there is a, a previous life to this and to you know people like Cameron uh, and their connections to 1965. 
uh, Pope Andreus, the, the July events and all this. I think this is a very, very interesting uh, story and everything that you said about the mobilization of the public opinion in these countries, again, as a background to what really happens, maybe as a climax with, uh, uh, with a Greek case.